everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Megan Lear and I work with the marketing team here at UMHS. Over the last few months, UMHS has hosted several live stream events for current and prospective medical students. And during those events, we've invited various UMHS alumni and experts to talk about their experience working in a range of uh, medical specialties, ranging from psychiatry and cardiology to working as an ob -GYN. And in some of our recent discussions, such as those featuring um, Dr. Soren Espold talking about LGBTQ plus healthcare or um, other doctors who talked about their career paths to working in Canada, we discovered that a lot of our UMHS alumni are working as hospitalists and finding very fulfilling careers um, in that area. And so we wanted to host another discussion to learn more. So tonight, we're very proud to welcome two UMHS alumni who also happen to be brothers, Dr. Camilo and Alejandro Pineda. Uh, and they are both hospitalists and here to answer the question, what is a hospitalist? So thank you both for joining us tonight. Of Thanks course. so much for having us. Thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah. So we're going to start with a few introductions and get some background information on both of you. So let's start with Camilo. Camilo, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, so um, like my brother, we both grew up in Missouri. Uh, our family came originally from Columbia, South America, and we came from my grandfather being a physician as well as my father being a physician. Um, and that, I think both uh, on both, both of our sides, we both got a little bit of um, a drive and a desire for medicine to begin with. And then as we kind of progressed through our studies, we ended up deciding that that was it for us. Uh, but overall, everything else um, after that just came natural to us. We just loved medicine and continued to pursue it. And then I guess we'll, we'll get into it further, why we chose hospitalists as our careers. Sounds good. And can you tell us too, just briefly, why you decided to attend medical school at UMHS? Yeah, so... <clears throat> And uh, I'll just be honest, there's a lot of people out there probably in pre-med or, or just getting into pre-med and things like that. Medical school is a very competitive field um, and it gets harder and harder every year. There are more requirements, higher scores needed and things of that nature. And I'll be honest, the first year that I applied to medical school, I applied to all U.S. schools, just like everybody else would. And I didn't get in. And so my path was I want to get into medical school. I want to be a physician no matter what it takes. And at that point in time, going to a Caribbean school, there was a stigma, there was a concern that it wasn't as good and, and things of that nature. And so I was a little bit scared, but at the same time, my drive said, let's just do it, let's push. And so I put myself out there. I said, I didn't want to wait. I don't want to wait another year, two years or, or doing all these other requirements just to get into a US school, which to me in the end, didn't really make a difference. I'm here, I'm a physician, I'm practicing. No one asked me, oh, you went to a Caribbean school. I don't think you're as good. No, that doesn't exist anymore. And um, so I just continued to push and it was a wonderful experience and it got me to where I was today. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity that UMHS gave me to begin with. Perfect. That's a great answer. And I appreciate you addressing what I think some concerns might be out there. So yeah. thank you for, thank you for that. Um, sure. Alejandro, medicine is obviously in your genes. Was wondering if you always knew that you wanted to be a doctor and kind of what your path was to um, a career in medicine. Yeah, similar to my brother, you know, and I think uh, maybe in my own mind, I was a little bit more rebellious and I thought, you know, maybe I won't do the same as these other guys. And I thought, um, you know, what else can I do? And to be honest, I had a lot of passions. I had art was my main passion. I thought, you know, one day maybe I'll be an artist. And, you know, to be honest, uh, I still love that concept for, you know, my own hobbies and other things. But I think my dad recognized that very quickly, that art was really what drove me and got me excited. And so he introduced me to a lot of anatomy books, uh, and specifically in the field of his field of internal medicine and gastroenterology. And I think he kind of very uh, kindly pushed in my direction and said, hey, you know, if you get your MD, maybe you can be a medical illustrator. And, you know, I kind of got those books. I got more and more excited. You know, you kind of grow up and you recognize, you know, I want to be a professional and, and, you know, slowly but surely without really uh, forcing me into it, I, I kind of fell into it on my own uh, with a really smart way that my dad did. So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I followed in those footsteps in just a different manner than my brother. 
I love it. Your dad's a pretty creative man to be mm-hmm. able to connect right. anatomy books and your mm-hmm. passion for art with medicine. So well done to your dad on that. Yeah. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about why you chose to also go to UMHS um, with your brother? Sure. So, you know, similar type of situation as my brother, you know, I I wanted to be a physician and I didn't get in uh, my first year of of applying. And luckily for me, I had an older brother who, you know, had a very similar path to me. And uh, he had come across UMHS. and, And essentially what I got was a really great example of a school that was secure and knew that had a path forward for me to succeed. Our end goals were always the same, be a physician, you know, take care of human beings, right? How we got to that, to be honest, early on, it didn't matter. And it Mm -hmm. it just so happened that UMHS was that channeling event for us to actually access what we knew we had in us to to be able to care for people. So, I mean, uh, having my brother be on the island and I could call him and be like, hey, you know, uh, I'm thinking about maybe going to the Caribbean too. How is it? And he could give me live updates as to how everything was going, how everything was structured, essentially telling me, go for it. Everything's all good here. That's great. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, And that was actually something that I I wanted to bring up at the beginning of the call that I failed to mention that was since not everybody has an older brother that's gone to UMHS ahead of you to answer your questions. If anybody tuning in tonight has specific questions um, about uh, Camilo or Alejandro's experience at UMHS, um, what it's like for them to currently work as hospitalists. At any point, if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat and we will be responding to questions throughout the discussion tonight. So, um, so feel free to drop your questions into the chat and we will address them as they come in. Um, but so we've, we've kind of talked a little bit about your, your background and your family's strong tradition of working in medicine. Um, Camila, let's start with you. Could you tell us a little bit about your residency program, where you did your residency um, and just kind of describe your experience? Sure. So um, I did my residency at the University of Missouri in Columbia, our actual hometown. Uh, My residency was internal medicine and pediatrics, so it's a combined residency program. They smash six years into four, Uh, so it was a pretty intense program, I would say, Uh, while uh, some people or some residents will have some extra time off or some extra weekends off or some electives, which allows you to have weekends. We were kind of just straight through, and we didn't have that many weekends, but I will say Um, out of those four years, I do feel that I came out very well trained, uh, just for the fact that, and there were various examples whenever I was on either side. So we basically would do internal medicine for three months, and then we'd switch the next three months would be pediatrics. And then we'd continue to switch that for four years. But I had various instances, which were funny to me at the time, but interesting to me for me to think about now going backwards is as a resident, you look at your attendings as the all-knowing, the people that know the best, the most and the best. But there were times where I was in one or the other spot, res- uh, internal medicine or pediatrics, and the attendings would be asking me my opinion since I was trained in the other side. And I always thought that was really incredible, number one, to be able to have that knowledge and that skill base, but also for the fact that me thinking I'm only a year or two years in and I'm getting that question from an attending that's been practicing medicine for who knows how long. Um, But I will say that I felt that I was very well cared for at that residency. I was very well trained at that residency. And I saw a great deal of a variety of illnesses and diseases. So I feel very comfortable coming out of there, uh, being able to treat the population that I have here. Perfect. And I know that you worked on your residency during the pandemic, really the peak of COVID. So was just wondering if you wanted to address that at all and how that might have impacted um, your program and your experience. Yeah, so it was definitely a very interesting time. Um, there were a lot of extra hours because residents were falling ill and they had to be in quarantine. So the people that pick that up are the other residents. And in, in large residency programs, the residents are the ones that run the hospital. So it was a very trying and difficult time and honestly scary time. Uh, during the pandemic, I would come home and to be frank, I would 
derobe in the laundry room just because I didn't want to get my wife sick or my family member sick or anything like that. And I would go straight and shower. I wouldn't touch or look at anybody close just because I didn't want to pass anything along. But sure. at the same time, I will say that throughout all of my residency, you'll get patients or, or other people that are say, oh, how do you do it? Like, how, how is it that you were able to manage so many hours? And to be honest, you have to have that many hours. You have to have the, that many hours of training to be able to be proficient and efficient at your position. Um, I don't understand really moving forward, people that don't have our level of training, how they can effectively treat their patients. Because if I hadn't had the experience, hadn't seen what I've seen, I'm not going to have that stuck in my mind. It's one thing to be able to read it in a book, but then to treat that in person and deal with the disease in front of your face, that's a whole different story. Sure, sure, absolutely. And how would you say your residency experience kind of helped guide you towards becoming a hospitalist? How did that kind of help create a pathway? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of us struggle when we first get into residency. Um, is this the path for me? Where am I going to go after this? Especially if you choose internal medicine or pediatrics or somewhere where you can do a specialty. Um, I think what kind of fine-tuned my decision to become a hospitalist was the fact that nowadays, when you get into medicine, you give your life to medicine. That, that becomes most and half of your life. So the only one thing that you can totally get back from that is time. And with being a hospitalist over being a primary care provider in a clinic or anything like that, you get that back because most hospitalist positions out there are one week on, one week off. And so there are very, very few jobs out there that can say, I work half the year. And if you choose to work more, you can definitely do that. But to me, that's an amazing thing for us to go into medicine and say, I've, I'm sacrificing going to this event, I'm sacrificing this family time, I'm sacrificing this party or whatever it may be. But once you get to be a hospitalist, you can modify your schedule quite a bit. And I mean, there's a lot of variations on that, but being able to say, I work half the year, that gives you a lot of that time back to be able to spend with your friends, family, and everything that you kind of missed out on and kind of recoup all of that. That's an excellent point. And we're definitely going to revisit that point and expand on it uh, in just a bit. Uh, but first, I wanted to give Alejandro a chance to just to talk a little bit about where you did your residency and, um, you know, maybe share how that prepared you for the work that you're doing now. For sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, no, so I did my residency at University of Missouri also uh, just within the internal medicine program. So a three year program. Um, I missed my brother just by one uh, year. So we didn't actually overlap, but we know a lot of the same people and we all, you know, a lot of our friends are within the same space of, of you know, going back and forth. Uh, very similar uh, type of experience as my brother in regards to the training that we received. I look back now, now that I've worked at a few different hospitals and we got a great uh, residency training. And I, and I say that in the sense of, of both quality as well as overall proficiency in, in what we do now. Um, I don't feel very often that I don't know where my North Star is in regards to training or, or treating a patient. I at least know which way to point uh, the, the ship in order to actually get to the right place. Um, the, the program itself is an academic institution, but also community-based. You're taking care of that small community of 100,000 people or the rural areas around it. So you get a good feeling that it's a relatively large program. I think the intern class is about 30 uh, around there. And um, you really kind of get to know uh, why you're doing this. And, and so it, it pushes you to the right level uh, of challenge in order to be better. It's pretty incredible too, that both you and your brother were able to complete your residency really in your hometown at a yeah. community mm -hmm. hospital. So that's a really unique experience also, and, and definitely very special. Um, Alejandro, just one more kind of follow-up question related to your residency and your training. And that is kind of how your passion for art and your kind of um, background in art, how does that influence the way that you practice medicine or what, what, skills do you bring from working in art into working? Great patients? question. Um, 
so I'm a pretty passionate guy about what I do. Um, and the type of art that I do uh, is very detailed, very, uh, very fine tuned, very tiny little things, very like you have to look at it, you know, you can look at it from every perspective and you see very small things and it takes a long time. How I practice medicine, how I approach medicine is very similar where it's very detailed. It, it doesn't miss a single thing. And I approach it in the same way as whenever I paint or draw, I take a step back and say, is this complete? Is this, is this exactly how I want to leave it? And that determination of when you know it's complete is based a lot of it instead of most artists, which are very subjective and say it's perfect because who knows it's subjective, right? But for me, it's complete because I know it's complete because it includes everything that my brain says it should be. So it's very systematic how I approach it. But at the same time, uh, I feel very complete reciprocation of the completion of, of treating a patient. It, it's a really good feeling for me. Perfect. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, kind of tied into that mm -hmm. response, I know that when we were having some discussions leading up to this live stream event, Camilo, you talked about appreciating the fact that UMHS provides the opportunity to do clinical rotations across the United States and how that provides you with a more complete sort of um, exposure to treating patients. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about maybe how those rotations helped prepare you for practicing medicine. Definitely. So I think it's a very interesting concept in medicine that you will find certain diseases in certain parts of the United States, let alone the world, that you won't see in other parts of the United States. And so I think it's a very, very unique opportunity that UMH offers that you can do rotations, clinical rotations, all throughout the U.S. Um, just as an example, for example, here in Atlanta, um, you're going to see a lot of sickle cell crisis. You're going to see a lot of sickle cell disease. And you're not going to see that that much in other places. So you're not going to get that same level of education and experience. And whenever you don't have that level of education and experience, you don't really know how to deal with it. Um, just the same, whenever we did our residency in Missouri, Missouri at University of Missouri, there is actually a very big cystic fibrosis center. And on the pediatric side, we deal with a lot of cystic fibrosis patients where here in Atlanta, I don't see any, but I have that training in mind. So I think Having that ability to travel the United States, if you choose to do so or not, and go to rotations in other states and other different systems, you can learn how community hospitals work, university hospitals work, how diseases are seen in certain areas of the United States that aren't in other places. So I think that's a very interesting concept that most medical students from the United States will not be able to see, unfortunately, unless they choose to do one or two rotations abroad. But that, I think that's a very interesting concept that UMHS offers. And Perfect. Megan, if, if yeah. I can add, you know, I, I think he brings up good points, but, you, you know, as a student, you really get an idea of what other hospitals are like. Every hospital has its own ecosystem, its own culture, positive or negative. You really get a good perspective of finding mentors, of attendings, of staff, of nurses, uh, of just the overall culture of the city itself that gives you a perspective of, hey, when I'm done with all this, where am I going to go? Yeah. Right. Do I want to be at a community hospital? Do I want to be at a hospital that does, you know, like this, that has this? I mean, essentially, it gives you a good blueprint of what you want for your future beyond residency, which is I mean, the ultimate goal. Thank you. That's a, that's a great um, point to add. Um, and then we did just have a question in the mm -hmm. chat that I wanted to go to. But but before we get to that, just really quickly, because they're related. The question that we're all here to answer, Alejandro, I'll start with you. Can you explain what a hospitalist is? What is a hospitalist? Let's define it. Sure. That. Yeah. So, and and I'll ask, you know, I'll answer it from uh, to, you know, obviously we have some students and then prospective students. So if your loved one comes to the hospital, the person that admits that patient for any medical needs, so any internal medicine needs is a hospitalist. And I'll compare that to what it was. Uh, probably over 20 years ago now that in the past you had your primary care physician that you see in clinic. And if your patient gets admitted to the hospital, that primary care doctor as a general internist would then follow you and see you when you're in the hospital. That has changed over the last few years for lots of different reasons. Uh, 
always advocating to essentially see patients sooner for the hospital to actually see these patients, take care of these patients sooner. And so the role of a hospitalist was created. So the hospitalist manages all of the care of the majority of patients outside of mainly surgical patients throughout their entire hospital course, admits them, gets them the treatment, correlates with specialists, and then discharges them appropriately to follow up with the appropriate people afterwards. So uh, the best way I describe it is when you're admitted to the hospital, your hospitalist is the captain of the ship. Perfect. I think that's a good response. And then Camilo, I am going to direct the question from the chat to you, except I just lost it. Here we go. Um, so this question is coming from an MD candidate. And the question is, and I think this was in response to something that you were referencing earlier. How could a hospitalist work half a year? You do six months on and six months off, or do you mean by doing rotation work like two weeks on and two weeks off? Yeah. So there's, uh, there's a, grand variety of that and you'll find that out whenever you do get to the position where you're applying to jobs you have places where they're transitioning to just full work weeks and you're just working five days a week and weekends off and then they equate it to basically you only work half the year or half the amount of weeks per year uh, the one that i'm doing currently is you do seven days on seven days off all throughout the year with some wiggle room here and there um, depending on who your director is or whoever your person that's in charge of scheduling, you can say, hey, I want to work two weeks straight so I can have two weeks off. Uh, but usually that's what the contract is, where you work half the year or a little bit half the year. And um, the reason for that is because as a hospitalist, you do kind of have a pretty heavy load at times. You have some acutely ill patients. And just like my brother was explaining, a hospitalist takes care of someone that's sick enough to be in the hospital. It's not just somebody that comes into an office and say, oh, I don't feel very well. It's somebody that's, I'm sick. I need to be in the hospital. And so you have to manage things not only quickly, efficiently, uh, but also carefully to make sure that they don't leave and come back. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and then Alejandro, back to you. I know that you were talking about how your dad did internal medicine, that he was a gastroenterologist. How would you, so he was a more traditional internist, right? Um, how would you say that your work as a hospitalist differs from what your dad did 20 years ago? Yeah, so, um, you know, in a lot of ways, what he did was he was both, right? He was a hospitalist because not every internist saw their patients with the amount of efficiency required uh, that usual hospitalists do now. So, he was having to get up very early in the morning, see his patients that were already in the hospital, then rush over to clinic, see his clinic patients. And then if there was any patients that were still in the hospital or got admitted thereafter, go see him at any time of night. So essentially you had a, a primary care physician that was on call every single day of the year, unless someone was covering for him. So, you know, uh, the general internist in that regard that could do it like that, the patients were all very well taken care of. But of course, there's a burden to that. There's a burden to your own time. There's a burden to your family time. And if you're willing to do that, uh, you know, fantastic. But unfortunately, you know, one thing that that we've seen is that physicians only have so much rope. And, and so I think that that's why the hospitalist position was created in an attempt to both care for that patient sooner, make sure that that patient was visibly being seen closer uh, and that accountability was held by every party, which meant for, uh, for the primary care doctor to have someone to rely on, to have eyes on the patient, for the hospital to have someone in-house to see that patient right away and manage the finances that go involved with that. And also ultimately for the patient to actually have someone that's dedicated to the practice of acute care uh, which is a little bit different, like my brother said, of clinic medicine. Sure. So can you tell us a little bit about then where you work? What kind of patients do you see? What kind of community is it? Could you just kind of describe, you talked a little bit about where you did your residency, but curious where you're working now. And if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. So uh, after residency, my wife uh, being from Chicago and me growing up in Missouri, super cold. And we took one look at each other and said, should we move somewhere warm? And we said, yup. And so uh, I moved to Arizona with my wife and uh, we love it. And I live in uh, Scottsdale and I work in a uh, kind of 
uh, suburb of Phoenix Valley, which is called Mesa, Arizona. I work in a 150 bed hospital called Mountain Vista Medical Center. It's uh, an academic uh, institution. I have residents and it's a part of uh, internal medicine residency as well. And um, we see quite a variety of patients here, mainly because it's close to the border. So you get lots of uh, immigrant population. You get a lot of snowbirds that come from the Midwest. So I definitely uh, get to meet a lot of people back that are from my hometown. That happens occasionally. And we get a lot of Canadians too that, that come down for the whole winter. Uh, so you get a lot of pathophysiology that comes here that's pretty unique. Um, but uh, I, I very much enjoy where I work in the whole area as well. Perfect. Um, and then Camila, I want you to, if you could, just to yeah. talk a little bit about where you currently work, what kind of patients you see. Yeah, definitely. So I work in the kind of the Atlanta region. Uh, I work out of a hospital named Emory Decatur Hospital. Um, so it's part of the Emory University conglomerate, as you will. Um, the hospital actually used to be a private hospital and then was bought out by Emory. So it's part of the university system. What's different about my hospital is that I don't have residents, even though it is an academic institution. I just kind of do everything on my own. I, I see all my patients on my own. I don't have anybody that kind of really helps me. I, I lead my team in terms of social workers, case managers, physical therapists, nurse, charge nurses, all those type of things. Um, but uh, similarly, like my brother, I'm probably slightly different population. Um, because we're not on the border, but we do see people from literally all around the world. I've had patients from Ukraine, Somalia, Germany, people from all places. And I've had people that are very well off, very not well off, homeless people. So it is an interesting group of patients that you get to see and an interesting set of disease that you could see. And, and that was a big draw for me because number one, I went into medicine not to care for a specific population. Like I went into medicine to care for everybody and anything. Uh, everybody deserves the same amount of treatment. Everybody deserves the top level treatment and being able to give that here in Atlanta and in Emory is amazing to me. Perfect. Perfect. And Alejandro, could you tell us just a little bit, just sort of paint a picture for the people who are tuning in, what a day in the life looks like for you as a hospitalist? Sure. Uh, and, and, you know, my role has changed a little bit. I'm, I'm a lead hospitalist, so I oversee, uh, you know, my hospice team and three hospitals uh, within that area. But I, I'm, I'm going to tell you kind of what, from a general hospice perspective of what that looks like on a not week off, because when it's a week off, it's amazing. I wake up a little later and have a cup of coffee, but on my week on, I usually arrive at the hospital about 6.30. Um, I have my list of patients that I know I'm gonna see for that day to start off. Uh, I start reviewing those patients uh, on my own and I look over what, you know, all the new labs, all the vitals, all of the necessary things of what my plan will be for those patients. And then I usually have my residents meet me at around 8 a.m. And then we actually academically round at the bedside on every single one of those patients, generally about 15 mm -hmm. to 20 patients. And then we go see those patients and then we kind of discuss, we you know learn about them and then educate the residents and medical students a little bit until we're done with that. Uh, throughout that day, there's kind of just one or two meetings in regards to uh, interdisciplinary rounds, which essentially means the entire ancillary staff is required to get patients out of the hospital. So they need to be discharged home, home with home health, a skilled nursing facility, essentially everything in a bundled package for them to do well outside the hospital. Uh, so once you wrap that up, uh, you know, essentially it depends on whether you're on call to take admissions for me. If I'm, if I'm all set and done, if it's 2 p.m., I can go home and handle the rest of my call from home. Uh, and then I get to relax and play with my kiddo and my dog and wait for the next day. Perfect. And Camilo, you mentioned that you don't have um, residents that you work with, correct? So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your day might differ a little bit from your brothers and what kind of support resources you have yeah, um, for your patients. So my day starts similarly to my brother. I usually get there around seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and have my list of patients uh, that can range between 12 patients or 17 patients, depending on the day, depending on how busy the hospital is. And I'll start off the same as my brother, first cup of coffee. That's always very important. 
And then I'll just go through my list one by one, each patient. Um, and I'll, I'll look to see if it's a new patient on my list, or if it's an older patient on my list, if there's anything that needs to be ha- handled immediately, uh, because I'm the person that has to do that. I'm not going to c- call anybody to do it. So each one, I go one by one. And then around 9 a.m. or so, um, if I haven't already rounded on my patients and seen them or followed up on certain things, I meet with some of the staff that my brother was speaking about. And that staff is social workers, case workers, physical therapists, pharmacists, all those types of things. Um, those, those are the people that help us uh, do the non-medical aspect of uh, the job. And ones that say, okay, this person's going to have to go to a nursing home, or this person's going to have to go to uh, a rehab facility. I, we don't know how to arrange those things. And so they're the ones that kind of facilitate all that, talk to insurance companies, all those type of things to let us handle the medical aspect. And so then after that, I, I finish out seeing all my patients, speak to any consultants I need to speak to, resolve any issues I need to resolve. And similarly as my brother, if I get done around three o'clock or so, then I, I can leave if I'm not on call and everything else is just handled by phone call. Um, we have a, I have a wonderful team that we have the understanding where none of us want to live at the hospital. So if I want to go home at three o'clock, then the call person has the understanding that if there's something that needs to be seen in the hospital physically by eye, then we just make a phone call and say, Hey, would you mind go seeing this patient? I'm worried about this, this, and this. And they say, no problem. And so it's a wonderful, important situation to have a good team around you. So that way you guys have a, or you have a situation where I scratch your back, you scratch my back. Um, and we kind of have a comfortable lifestyle. Perfect. Yeah, it's definitely, you're definitely uh, painting a picture that working as a hospitalist is a really nice kind of lifestyle path for people in medicine. Um, and I I definitely want to revisit that and, and dive a little deeper into it, but just hearing both of you talk (laughs) about, um, caring for the patients from the moment they check in through, um, through the time that they're discharged. It sounds to me that in addition to being a great career choice for um, for doctors, that there's also a real advantage to the patients that you're seeing as well um, because of that kind of continuity of care. So um, I guess Alejandro, I'll I'll throw the question to you first. What do you see as some of the biggest advantages to patients for working with a hospitalist? Yeah, so the the great question. the, the patient essentially gets someone that's dedicated to that craft, right? I mean, if you kind of look at every other field, you know, if you go and uh, decide to go to a restaurant and you get a pizza at a place that makes burgers, yeah, you might get a pretty good pizza. But if you go to a Neapolitan brick oven pizza plate, you know you're going to get a real pizza, right? Similarly, in this case, if a patient comes in for an acute illness that's put them in the hospital, What better than the specialist of the craft of acute internal medicine, which is a hospitalist. So essentially they get someone that does it completely right with the level of expertise that's required for that disease process. And someone that knows how to also move patients out appropriately. So, you know, a lot of times you can say, well, the patient's still in quite a bit of pain, but the hospitalist understands that perhaps if the patient stays a little bit longer, they're at higher risk of developing infections, or iatrogenic infections or, or, or things that are essentially caused by being in the hospital. And, and the hospitalist knows how to avoid those things and get the patient to the next step of getting better. Perfect. And Camilo, I know your brother um, painted a pretty vivid analogy with the Neapolitan pizza, but <laughs> was just wondering, was just wondering if you had anything else that you yeah. wanted to add any other advantages that you wanted yeah. to share. I think um, to add to that, I think it gives the patients a lot of peace. <clears throat> and I've experienced that many times where, for example, Monday, I'll start and I'll admit a patient. And I tell the patient that from today until the end of the week, I'm yours. And that brings them a lot of peace because one of the most, I guess, nerve wracking and, and frustrating things for a lot of patients are they're in a hospital and they see so many different doctors and so many different people, they lose track of who's taking care of them. But if they just see a familiar face every day, every morning, every afternoon, that brings them so much more peace and brings them so much more confidence in the system, what you're doing, how you're treating them. Because I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a room and I introduce myself and like, oh, it's so happy. I remember you from yesterday. And then I ask, oh, did this physician see you or did this physician see you? And their answer is, oh, I don't know. I've seen so many doctors. So I think it's a very wonderful thing 
um, that kind of bridges the gap from 20 something years ago, whenever your primary care doctor would come into the hospital physically, it's almost that similar feeling just now that a hospitalist is able to handle more acute care as opposed to a primary care can't devote as much time as we can. So it's a really nice uh, bridge that is now been creating the medicine. I think that's a really great point. And, and um, you know, to your point about the patients having the familiar face coming in day after day, I mean, I can tell you too, having loved ones who have been in the hospital, I'm sure it's also a great comfort to like family and loved ones who are trying to, you know, navigate um, yeah. working with different doctors. So I think that's a really, I think that's a big, important point. It definitely. 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 And the hospital is a stressful situation and having someone that you can just say, that's the person I call if there's a problem with my dad, my mom, my brother, mm -hmm. my sister, whoever, that brings you so much more peace in knowing that things are being handled. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and also just kind of going off script here a little bit, I was just curious if either one of you, and this is sort of a, a free for all, whoever wants to answer, if either of you have any examples of patients that you've worked with that might have come in with something very unique or different and working as a hospitalist, you're being able to kind of maybe like diagnose them and see them through and, and get them discharged. Any interesting kind of stories from the hospital that you'd want to share with people? There's a lot of those, I think. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of one specifically. And, you know, people always want to hear the weird, gross ones or, you know, uh, the, the strange diseases. But, uh, you know, I just will say, you know, from a hospice perspective in sometimes, I mean, really what you see is kind of bread and butter things, Megan, you kind of see this, a lot of the same things every day. And so I really, you know, although you get those really interesting mm -hmm. cases, the truth is that medicine within the United States is to this point where everyone has hypertension, everyone has diabetes and everyone smokes and everyone has heart disease, right? But every day we glance right by them because they're so common. We see this thing drive by every single day but how many doctors take the time when someone's really acutely ill to say, this is it, this is the last time. And here's why, right? To actually walk them through these very boring diseases and say, here's what you need to do about this. Here's why, here's what you need to do about this one. Here's why, here's the doctor you need to follow up. Here's the medicine you need to take. And here's why. I think one of the things that I enjoy most about this job is that if you really enjoy the idea of organization and clarity and ever had that experience with a loved one in the hospital where things weren't completely transparent or structured in a way for you to understand in a one, two, three, four, five format to have someone hand it to you almost like an Ikea uh, uh, manual of how to put together a table. It's the most beautiful thing in the world for a patient to finally understand how to take care of their diabetes or finally understand why I have to take my blood pressure medicine. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that's not a cool, interesting disease, but that's my take. Yeah, I definitely agree that's with good. that. I think that's one of the most rewarding things whenever you kind of are able to teach a patient or explain to them. I think that's the, one of the things that uh, everybody else that's listening right now, <clears throat> pre-medical students, medical students, the most important thing that you can do to a patient or for a patient is explain to them what's going on and why you're doing something. Because uh, a lot of medicine has turned into, here's this drug, here's the script, take it, it'll fix it. And they are left with just saying, I don't know why. And then you're turned into the situation of, this is why patients don't follow recommendations because they don't know why they have to do it. If they don't know why, they're gonna say, oh, it's not that big of a deal. But if you explain to them, if this happens, this happens, and then this happens, then they'll do it. Um, but in regards to an interesting case, I've seen quite a few. One of the most, uh, I guess I'll say, one of the most interesting ones that just like speaks to me is the fact that I had a old couple and they were driving cross country. They landed in the hospital because they got pulled over for apparently looking like they were driving drunk. Short story, after discovering a bunch of stuff that was going on, they ended up getting carbon monoxide poisoning and oh, wow. their basically their catalytic converter was clogged. And so I actually had to speak to the university mechanic to look over their car while both people were admitted to the hospital and they evaluated it. They put carbon monoxide testers in the car and it just started going off. And wow. 
one of the most interesting things is, I mean, carbon monoxide poisoning, it's a very tricky thing to diagnose, but at the same time, it's funny that there's not much that you do to treat it. You just give them a lot of oxygen. You wait it out for it to get out of their system and make sure that there's no big complications. And what's so interesting about that in my mind is you think of medicine being this humongous, like you're going to do this surgery and this medication and all these things, but it was just oxygen and time, but you have to know what you're dealing with and know how to diagnose it. Wow. I can't, I can't top that. That's pretty cool. (laughs) That's a pretty cool one. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, So I I think that you've both done a really good job of reviewing what the advantages are for patients and loved ones of patients who are in the hospitals. Um, And so I just wanted to kind of go back to what we've been sort of talking about throughout the, the discussion tonight. And that is what you see as the biggest advantages of working as a hospitalist. So um, I guess Alejandro, I'll just kind of start with you. Um, why should someone consider being a hospitalist? What are the biggest advantages? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, lifestyle is a big one, right? Like my brother said, the, the, the pull of a seven on seven off lifestyle, when you have hobbies, when you have other passions, when you have family and friends, to be honest, you put a lot of time and effort to get to this point. You put a lot of time and effort even to get to medical school, to get into residency. And then after all of that, in my own head, when I was considering my options of having to work 30 days a month, you know, for or work the whole year, be on call fairly often. I love my family and I love the other things that I do. As much as I am a, a hospitalist, it isn't who I am. It is a part of who I am, and it is a large part of of why I am who I am, but I didn't decide to dedicate the entirety of my time to this field. Hospitalist gave me a really good opportunity to practice medicine on my time, and and to be honest, you know, you might say, well, you only work half the year. That's only, you know, what, half of a month? What are you doing those other two weeks? Well, to be honest, those other seven days are tough. Like you, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of impacts to that, to your own psyche. So, you know, it, it sounds really great right off the bat, but I also give the caveat is work seven days in a row, seeing really sick people, 20 patients a day in the peak of COVID asked to pick up more shifts because there's no one else in the world that can do what you're doing. And you might say, you know what, seven days off isn't enough. Um, so you have to have a significant passion for it. You have to uh, decide that medicine is not the most lu- lucrative of all the specialties of you know the medical fields and specialties, um, but it is one that if you really enjoy that reciprocation of, of patients being cared for and thanking you, even if it's on the once a week basis, it's a pretty good gig. Yeah. Thank you. Camila, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? What you would yeah. maybe say to students who are considering becoming a hospitalist? Yeah, I'll definitely second that. Um, Like I alluded to earlier, one of those things that no one has control of is time. And we unfortunately have to give up a lot of our time to get to where we want to get to. So being able to get some of that back by only working half the year, that's an amazing feat. You can't say it. You can't find many jobs out there that say I work half the year. Um, And like my brother mentioned, it might, might, might not be the most lucrative field in medicine, but at the same time, when you take into the fact that you only work half the year, it's pretty good. Um, another aspect that I will kind of uh, speak to is the fact that being an internist or a hospitalist, it allows you to become a very well-rounded physician. And that was one of my biggest drives to becoming a physician. I like to be a person that can handle most situations or take care of most situations. And I didn't want to be in a situation where, let's say, a family member gets sick or a friend gets sick and I just don't know the answer. I wanna be able to guide them and give them my knowledge and being in internal medicine or uh, pediatrics or family medicine, one of the more, um, I guess, uh, primary care fields gives you a very well-rounded understanding of patient care uh, and a good knowledge base to be able to handle most situations. And I find that really, relieving and and respectful in terms of medicine. Uh, there are so many times where you, you start speaking to specialists and, and very grantedly specialists start forgetting a little bit of the 
regular primary care. And that's to them because of the fact that they focus on a specialty. Uh, but at the same time, it's really important to have the core understandings of medicine and never forget those, I think. Perfect. Perfect. And I wanted to come back to something that both of you just sort of referenced when you were describing, um, you know, what a hospitalist does and why students should possibly consider that. Talking about the seven days on, seven days off kind of schedule, how do you avoid burnout during those periods where you have long stretches? Camila, I'll start with you. Yeah, so that's a very, very good question. Um, I think, and maybe... Maybe it might take some time for me to get to that point where I say I'm starting to feel burnout. I think coming out of residency, anything out of residency feels very different and very nice because you go through residency training and it is very intense. And, and I don't say this to prospective students to scare you. Everybody knows medicine is difficult to get into. Everybody knows medicine is difficult to get through. Um, just know the fact that if you are conscious about mental health, if you're conscious about your own time, if you're conscious about your own emotions, you can say, okay, uh, today I'm feeling really tired. I'm just going to take the day for myself whenever it's your day off or pick up some hobbies to just disconnect because there are so many times that I, during residency and after residency, after you've finished the job, you're still thinking about a patient. Why? Because we care. We want to make sure that everybody's taken care of. And it's hard sometimes to disconnect, but you have to almost sometimes force yourself, whether that be exercise or playing games with friends, um, chatting with friends, whatever it may be. Um, but it's a conscious effort sometimes that you have to make just because you get so intertwined with the job and that being 24 seven that you forget that you have to try to physically and mentally disconnect. Sure. That's great. Alejandro, did you have anything that you wanted to add of ways that students, residents, hospitalists can avoid burnout? Yeah, no, I, I agree with my brother on a lot of those points. It's it's really time away uh, from the actual job itself that you've dedicated yourself to. Just as much as you can really love someone, but you know, spend maybe one entire weekend every waking minute with them in a cabin isolated in the forest, it's going to get a little, uh, a little rough sometimes. So um, Either way, you know, you need to disconnect and, and you also need a support team. And that means either your friends or your family or a specific person that you can talk to that perhaps understands it a little bit better than your friends and family, which sometimes is just not the right person. Um, I myself find a lot of relief and in, in just talking it over with my own loved ones, with my wife. And, and when we disconnect and travel and do things completely outside of medicine is when I feel my best and my most self uh, after taking a little time off. So uh, it, it, that's just, it, it's just as much as I tell my patients, hey, you need to take this pill every day for your blood pressure. I, you got to do the same as a physician. You got to take, you got to swallow the pill of time off. Uh, otherwise it, it, it's just not going to pay off in the long run. Yeah. And I'll also okay. add to that. That's one caveat to the hospitalist position. That's definitely amazing. You're not going to really find that with primary care or any specialty. <laughs> On your week off, you're off. You don't have to answer any phones, nothing. If you're in a primary care field, you're going to get constant questions now from patients. If you're in a specialty field, you're going to get constant questions in your inbox with patients. But as a hospitalist, I get home. If it's my week off, I turn off my phone. I don't have to do anything. Perfect. Perfect. And something else, another point that, that you both sort of referenced, I wanted to come back um, and address specifically, because I think it's top of mind for a lot of people tuning in is how would you rate the compensation for hospitalists as compared to other specialties or other primary care um, positions? Yeah. So I think, I guess I can start off with that. Uh, it very much varies. And it's once you get to that point, you're going to see and I'll just, I'll just put this out there because I think it's very important for medicine as a whole to start discussing salaries because we've been so fine-tuned and trained to say, we have to care about patients. We should never think about money. But frankly, number one, I'm going into medicine because I love medicine. But at the same time, I have a family that I want to take care of. I want a family that I want to support. And I want a family that I want to give the world to. So you have to talk about money at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've seen anywhere from a starting salary, not including bonuses to $200,000 a year. And I was just talking to a friend of mine who uh, is, he's about to finish residency. And one of his friends just got offered a contract in Oklahoma, I believe somewhere. 
And as a hospitalist, uh, specifically nocturnists, so they work night shifts, and they are offered $450,000. So there's a wide spectrum. And depending on how much you want to work, how you work, you can still make a very good living. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind the fact that $200,000, even at the low end, for working half the year is pretty good. And most of the time, working half the year is not all you do because you can pick up shifts wherever you want. Or let's say you want to do a locums position, which is uh, a physician that does extra gigs at a different hospital elsewhere to make up more money. If you choose to do so, you can do that as well. So it's just about, about how you spend your time and how you want to, how much you want to make in a sense. Perfect. Alejandro, do you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, no, I, and, and, you know, I, I hire new hospitalists uh, every, every few months. And, and so I have a good idea of what it's like. It's very state by state and it's very much determined on whether you live in the city or rural areas, rural areas tend to offer more money tend to be a little bit either more relaxed to have less resources, but the pay is much more. If you want to live in North Dakota, sometimes those contracts can be pretty lucrative. And if you want to do that for a couple of years and then move elsewhere, a lot of people do that. If you want to work nights, less lucrative position, like my brother said, ten, tends to be uh, more lucrative and tends to be more over that 300,000 per year. Um, Additionally, over that, like my brother said, it's a base, right? So that base generally is about 15 to 16 shifts on average per month, which means, hey, if you really want to work and make a whole lot of money, you know, you can really, you know, work 20 plus shifts a month and you're, you're living a very good life. I mean, plenty for, for most people with a, at least a small family. So uh, for the amount of days that you work and the ability to adjust and add on, or perhaps, you know, even if you have other pursuits, you know, some people want to be doctors, but they also have another uh, thing they want to, you know, spend their time on and make money another way. Uh, you have lots of options. Yeah. And just to allude, I mean, if it, if we're talking about money in terms of making like $200,000 base a year or whatever, and my brother alluded to, we usually work 15, 16 shifts a month. If you work the same amount that everybody else would work, you're making pretty good money, like specialty level money, if you choose to do so. So it's all about are you comfortable with that amount or do you want to make more? And that's all it is. Perfect. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm sure that everybody listening tonight too appreciates that, that information because, you know, these are practical concerns that people have, right? So yeah. uh, I think that's very helpful. So thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, Alejandro, I know that too, you're very involved in nurturing sort of uh, the future leaders in medicine and that you're very involved in sort of cultivating physician leaders and was just wondering if you could talk about your um your work on that front a little bit sure yeah and so my path to that and i'll just give you a little background um to that kind of role that i have now so just for everyone that's listening uh i'm a lead hospitalist uh and medical director for my medical group within all of the the hospitals that we oversee here uh, in, in Phoenix, uh, which is three hospitals. Uh, I'm four years out of residency now. First started, I was a hospitalist. Uh, I worked 16, 17 shifts a month. And what I realized is that I, I arrived at a hospital that was great, it had lots of very much positive things, but it also had a lot of things that I disliked. And so what I realized at one point was I could either complain and you know talk to my colleagues about how much I didn't like this and how much I didn't like that, but rather than doing so for the first time in really my you know, professional life, I said, you know, why don't I do something about it? So I got further involved with my medical director at that time, the lead hospitalist at that time, and said, here, you know, I have some solutions to this. I, I've seen it work like this at another hospital. What do you think about this? And I would offer myself in ways other than just to see more patients or just to do more shifts. And in doing so, I found someone that listened to me and implemented changes and affected 20 plus, you know, clinicians. It affected the hospital, affected patient experience scores. It affected so many metrics of things of how we grade ourselves on a daily and monthly basis. So, you know, fast forward another year, uh, I was kind of this medical director's right-hand man. And so I would go with him to meetings in regards to hospital administration if you fast forward one more year, uh, we expanded to another hospital and he gave me the opportunity to say, hey, I want you to launch a new hospitalist program 
here. I want you to uh, essentially be me, but at this other hospital and, and I'm gonna be there the whole way. And so I launched uh, a hospital with all new hospitalists and um, was able to kind of start this career of lead hospitalist, which now has propelled me to what his previous position was of overseeing three hospitals. So that being said, why did I do it? Because now, to be honest, that week off that I used to have, where I used to try to figure out what else I was going to do with my time, is now with uh, you know administrative meetings, and it's um, taking care of issues within my own hospital's team. It's taking care of issues within the hospital. But the reward I get from it is that I get a very happy hospitalist team. I can address issues to make their joy of practicing more. And I get to nurture not just my residents, but my own physicians that are excited like I was four years ago towards the betterment of our practice. And I think that to me is like the largest epidemic within what we do is unhappy doctors. I think if you, and I'm going to be very candid and trend, if you ask your average doctor nowadays of practicing, are you happy working at what you do? And unfortunately, the answer is not always positive. A lot of doctors say, yeah, I mean, I have some good days, but it's a job. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. But there's doctors that are doing it right. And there's doctors that are in environments that are nurturing to them, that are listening to them, that are having them enjoy what they do, see patients and be happy throughout that time. And that only benefits the patients. There's so many studies that show that compassion is generated by the doctor being happy. And so what I will say to the prospective students, to the students out there coming from someone that never really took that leap of really administrative duties or implementing change within a hospital, instead of complaining about why does the hospital do it like this? Or why does my medical school do it like this? Why does my school do it like this? I challenge you to find the leader of that program and find a solution on your own and present that solution in a very nice, structured, cohesive manner so that you can better that program rather than tear it away. Because the one thing we need for the future, if we really want to have happy doctors, the only solution to that is togetherness between doctors. No yeah. more arguing between us and understanding between us of what we all want, which is good, good financial compensation, good work environment, and overall resources to help us do what we do best, which is care for the patient. So uh, sure. I, I challenge all students, prospective students, don't just sit idle uh, wh whenever you see things you don't like. Professionally go about it to help us with the future of healthcare, which is such a, a big issue. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. That's all, all good advice. Um, and we just were getting close to wrapping up. So I just wanted to say one more time that if there are any questions from people tuning in to feel free to drop them into the chat and we will be sure to share your questions with um, Camilo and Alejandro. Um, and as we're waiting for that, uh, Camilo, I was just wondering if you had any other advice or words of wisdom that you wanted to share with uh, current and prospective med students who might be tuning in tonight. Yeah, I think. Um... There's probably so many people out there listening right now that just needs to hear the words. It's hard right now. It might get a little bit harder. It might get a little bit harder after that. <laughs> and to use just a plain word, it might suck for a bit, <laughs> but it will get better. And you're going to see the reaps of your rewards. You're going to see why you got into everything. And it's going to feel so much better when you're on the other side. Going through medical school is tough. Going through residency is exhausting. But then once you're practicing medicine and you are the attending, then it feels so much different and you realize this is all what I've worked for. So once you're in that position and you're getting through it, don't give up, just keep pushing forward. And if you're having doubts, if you're having issues, talk to somebody about it. Don't, don't hide it. Don't try and suppress it down. Um, and you read all these things and I'm sure all these prospective students are reading stuff on Reddit and things of that nature. There are a lot of, horrible things that happen to residents and horrible things that happen to medical students because of the stress. But the most important thing is seek help and make sure you get through it. Um, because initially you had that passion that started for a reason and you should, you should follow through because we need physicians like you that are devoted to people and devoted to healing. 
Um, and we're, we are in a deficit of physicians and we need people that want to help and make, make, the, make the world better. Perfect. I think that those words of encouragement are probably very welcome by everybody who's tuning in. Yeah. Um, one last question, either one of you are, are welcome to jump on this, but what would you say to the students uh, who are really just kind of struggling with imposter syndrome and worried that they're just, they might <laughs> not be good enough? I can answer that one if, if you're all right. Uh, you are not alone. It happens at every single stage, at every single instance. And every time you say, hey, I'm on to the next level, guess what? That day one, you get imposter syndrome. It's okay to have imposter syndrome, you know, and, and I think that's a hindrance to your own confidence. There's a difference between being cocky and having confidence, right? Be truthful to your knowledge base, be truthful to what you're good at, be truthful to your own personality. Because in my own experience, the residents and medical students that shine the most are the ones that are have a louder voice, the ones that show their confidence and the ones that are themselves. When you hide either one of those, you're only doing a, a disservice to yourself. I myself, every time, you know, I'll hop on a meeting and say, what the heck am I doing here? Uh, that still happens to me. So, uh, you know, it's shared by me almost on a, a weekly basis. So uh, embrace it. Yeah, I, I will second that imposter syndrome. I don't think it will ever leave you um, no matter how much experience you have, no matter what trials and tribulations you've gone through. Um, just know that that is there for a reason. That's because of the fact that you're at a level of training or you're going to be at a level of training that you're seeking something very, very high, the very small percentage of people actually in the world get to. And it's okay to feel like an imposter. <laughs> it's difficult. And there are times where, I mean, we're not robots. We don't know everything. And so, like my brother said, embrace it. If you have a question, ask somebody, because I guarantee the person next to you or the two persons next to you are feeling that same exact thing. And whenever you're in medical school or in pre-med and you think someone's talking and saying they have all the answers, they have imposter syndrome as well. They're just trying mm -hmm. to talk through it and talk it out loud. So don't be afraid. Perfect. Sounds like good advice. Uh, well, it doesn't look like we have any additional questions in the chat. So I just want to thank you both for tuning in. And I wanted to let everybody who is um, tuning in tonight, I wanted to let you know that both Camilo and Alejandro have offered to respond to any follow-up questions you might have, career-related questions. They are both on LinkedIn. So you can reach out to them directly on LinkedIn, connect with them, send them a message with your question, and they will get back to you. Um, you can find them pretty easily by going to Juan Camilo Pineda, um, search him on LinkedIn, find him at Emory. You can look for Alejandro. Um, he's in Arizona. So you could find them both pretty easily there and send them any follow up questions um, that might not have been addressed during this call. But Camilo and Alejandro, thank you both so much for your time and sharing your expertise tonight. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks for having us. It's just a, it's a good time. Yeah, it's wonderful to be on the other side now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Well, yeah. thank you so much. And for everybody tuning in, again, this will be posted. The recording of this discussion will be posted to the UMHS um, YouTube page. You can rewatch this discussion and you can also find other recent live stream events, lots of great content out there. So be sure to, um, to visit. And once again, thank you so much.